Um, I want to tell you a little bit about my trip. I'm not going to spend too much time because, honestly, I've, I've got a lot to say today and not a lot of time to say it. But I want to, I want to tell you a little bit about our trip. We went for a wedding. Um, Jordan Heatherly, who was in my young adult group and my junior high group here at this church, um, he got married last week on Sunday on top of a mountain. And so the, that week before, Megan and I flew to uh, Seattle, and we spent a couple days there, and then we drove up into Canada, and we spent about four days in one of the most beautiful places on earth. It was a place called Squamish. And it's just mountains and water, and I mean, it was just an amazing time. And, and, and one of the things we did that I'm, I'm super proud of, I'm not trying to brag too much, but one of the things I'm super proud of is that we climbed a mountain, which was pretty cool. How many of you look at me and say, that guy's a mountain climber? <laughs> Thank you, yeah. My wife feels the same way. <laughs> we got up, actually, we got there on, uh, on Thursday evening, and our first thing was this welcome dinner, and, and the welcome dinner was at this restaurant, and, and that re restaurant had big windows, and it looked out at what they call the captain, or no, the chief, I'm sorry, the chief. And the chief is this iconic mountain there, and the front of it is just a, a straight-up cliff, and then the back, it's kind of like Half Dome, if you know what Half Dome is, but this big mountain. And so I looked at it the first day, and I said, Megan, I could climb that. And she laughed at me, and so did the other people with me. And, and so we got up the last morning, and, and I said, what do you want to do today? And she said, I don't know, what do you want to do? And I said, I want to climb that mountain. And I honestly didn't believe we can do it, could do it. And, but, but we did it. We climbed this mountain, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that later. I'm not bragging because I want you to know that, that we did climb up the mountain, not straight up the rock face, but the trail. But I want you to know that we got passed by more people than I've ever been passed by on the road. And we took more breaks than I'm used to taking. But we did it. We got up there. Um, but, but one thing I want to talk about is, is traveling and and. If you know me, I, I like getting up here and talking to you guys. I like preaching. I'm not really an upfront person outside of preaching. And this is going to sound really bad, but I don't really like to be in big crowds. If you know me very well, you know one of my least favorite things to do is to be in a theater where other people are and hear them eating their popcorn or chewing their food or talking like it drives me insane. I've almost gotten fights over this before. I don't like being in big crowds. I tend to avoid the, the big places and, and it, I'm sorry, I should like people more than I do. I, I love people. I just don't always like people. But, but we traveled um, we, we traveled on planes and, and I'll tell you what, being on airplanes and in airports just, it gets to me. <laughs> how many of you love to travel? All right, how many of you like to be in an airplane, though, with other people? All right, you guys are crazy. You guys are crazy. <laughs> Let me tell you some of my biggest pet peeves when it comes to traveling, okay? This drives me insane, and I, I, I know that some of you in the sanctuary this morning are the people that I'm going to be talking about, and so I apologize in advance. Let me tell you a couple things that drive me insane. Number one, when you're on the plane and you land the plane and you're taxiing and then you're waiting for that seatbelt sign to go off so that you can get your stuff and leave the plane, right? And what happens the second that sign goes off? Everybody hops up. And there was one guy on one of our flights that we were about two-thirds of the way back on the plane, and as soon as that sign went off, he hopped up and he grabbed his bag and he started going up to the very front because he had to be as far up in the line as possible. And the ridiculous thing about this is they never even let you off the plane for another 10 minutes. So everybody stands up and muscles their way to get their place in line, and then we just sit there. I think it's the most ridiculous thing, and I'll be honest with you, when this guy just jumped up and grabbed his stuff and just made his way in front of everyone, I thought, who do you think you are? Wait your turn. We were getting ready to get off, and all these people just start piling by us, and I'm like, who do you think you are? Wait your turn. Another thing that drives me nuts is when you're going to the baggage claim to get your baggage, and all of a sudden, what do people do at the baggage claim? It's like... 
It's like thirsty animals going to water. They're, they get right up on the baggage claim and lean over because they've got to be the first one to get their eyes on the bag, right? Oh, man, it drives me nuts. Could we just all back up so that when we see our bag, we can walk up and get it and not block everyone else, right? We got on the last plane, and somebody thought it would be a good idea to bring their food on the plane. No problem, bring your food, unless you're eating fish. That's disgusting. I don't want to smell the fish the whole time we're flying in the plane. We had a four and a half hour flight, and I had to smell this person's fish. It's terrible. <laughs> Traveling just, oh man, it, it raises my blood pressure. And it brings something to light to me, and, and I'm sorry, if you're one of those people, I'm sorry for the people around you. <laughs> but traveling brings something to light that I think is true of all of us, and that's this. We tend to think and operate as if the world revolves around us. It, all you got to do is get on an airplane, go to an airport, get in your car, whatever. We tend to think and operate as if this whole world revolves around us. Today we're going to be talking a little bit about this because I think we do this in our faith as well, but we tend to think and operate as if the world revolves around us. And here's the problem. Here's the problem. It doesn't. I hate to tell you this today. I've got bad news, good news today. I hate to tell you this bad news, but the world does not revolve around you. One of the cool things about this wedding that we went to is we took this gondola ride up a mountain. I mean, it was kind of scary. It was straight up and glass all around and up this mountain. We got to the very top and this wedding happened on a little platform overlooking this whole valley and the water and the mountains and it was high up. And one of the things as we were riding up there and as we were standing there in this wedding is I looked out and I saw all of these evergreen or pine or whatever kind of trees they have there, all of these huge trees, probably 50 feet tall. And to me, where I was, they looked like just a row of ants. And I sat there and I thought, man, I am tiny when it comes to the grand scheme of things. We climbed up to the top of this mountain. Did I tell you I climbed a mountain? I climbed a mountain. <laughs> yeah, the chief, it was cool. We climbed up this mountain and I got to the top and I was quickly reminded at the top that this world does not revolve around me. In fact, I, I'm not one for heights. And we got up to the top and it was kind of this big like dome-like rock and there were places you could walk up and get closer to the edge, but like I said, the front of this mountain was just straight down. And so I didn't get that close to the edge. Here's the thing. We can think the world revolves around us all we want, but one false step on the top of a mountain, and it's over. In fact, on the way to climb that mountain, I Googled it just to see what it was all about. You know what the first thing that came up was? A story of somebody who was climbing the mountain and fell off and died. See, we tend to think that the world revolves around us, but the truth is we are pretty small and, and pretty tiny. We're kind of peons in this great big world. And the truth is one false step on a mountain, we'd find out pretty quick that the world doesn't revolve around us. And I want to take a look at the creation story because I just want, I really want to pound this into your head today that the world does not revolve around you because if I fly with you, I don't want to have to deal with these things, right? So let's look at the creation story. Genesis 1, 1 through 2 it says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. So in the beginning was what? It was me because the world revolves around me, Right? No, in the beginning was God, the Father, the Son, the Spirit. And in creation story, we see that this world started through God, not through me. And then we fast forward down to verse 26. It says, then God said, let us make mankind, this is our part, let us make mankind in our image and our likeness. 
so that they may rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the sky, over the livestock and the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. What day were we created on in creation? Day six. All right. So in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And on the sixth day, here we come. But we tend to think that everything revolves around us. Now, the sixth day isn't bad. I mean, we are a big part of this, but the world doesn't revolve around us. And I understand why we think that, because all the commercials you watch, all of the people you talk to, all of the things around you make it seem like everything's about you. I, even, I know I've talked about this before, but Saved by the Bell was one of my favorite shows growing up. And in Saved by the Bell, the main character, he could literally call a time out on everything and everything would stop and he could continue on because the world revolved around Zach Morris, right? But it doesn't. In reality, the world does not revolve around us. Well, today we're going to talk about the story of Job, and you're probably wondering how this ties into the good God and a broken world. Today we're going to be talking about the story of Job, and, and the reason we're talking about this is this is one of the main themes that I see in the story of Job, is this idea of who the world revolves around. And, and I want to be honest with you about something today. I'm not excited about preaching Job to you. Job is a difficult book to understand, and it is a really complex book to try to put into words. And so I'm going to ask you to be gracious with me, and if I say something that rubs you the wrong way, I'm going to ask you to come talk to me about it. But, but I want to start here with this idea, because I think this idea of who the world revolves around is a huge part of the book of Job. So let's start in, in Job chapter 1, verse 8. And some of these scriptures, I'm just going to warn you, they're difficult to deal with. I want us to enter into this difficulty. It's hard to talk about Job from the pulpit, but I don't want to ignore some of the questions we have with it. You can preach Job very easily by preaching certain verses. I'm not interested in that. Today I want to get into the depth of what this is all about. And so let's start in chapter 1, verse 8. It says, Then the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? There is no one like him on earth. There is no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. So God is bragging on Job. Hey, check out my boy Job. He's a, he's a righteous man. He fears God. Like, check this guy out. But listen to this next part. This part's difficult. Does Job fear God for nothing, Satan replied? Have you not put a hedge of a hedge around him and his household and everything he has. You have blessed the work of his hands so that his flocks and herds are spread throughout the land. But now stretch out your hand and strike everything he has and he will surely curse you to your face. Verse 12, the Lord said to Satan, very well then, everything he has is in your power, but on the man himself do not lay a finger. Now I told you you can preach Job easily, that's by avoiding these verses. Because this is difficult. I'm going to be really honest with you today. I don't understand what's going on here with it seems like this is a game, like God's like bragging about Job and then allowing terrible things to happen to Job. It seems pretty cruel to me. And I'm going to be honest with you. I, I don't know what, what the reason is for that, but I do know this. I do know that God loves Job, and I think if you'll stick with me through this, I think you'll see that, that Job is okay, that God was not trying to hurt Job, but that God loves Job and was with him. And so, so we see this, Job, verse 9, does Job fear God for nothing? God says, check out my boy Job, he, he loves me, he, he fears God, and Satan says, well, he only fears you. Because you make it really easy for him. You give him everything he wants. You protect him. You bless him. Everything's good. And so the main question is brought out early on in chapter 1. Is Job's faith dependent on the world revolving around him? 
Is his faith dependent on a God who caters to his needs? Do you understand what we're asking here? What Satan is basically saying to God is, sure, Job's a good guy. You know why he's a good guy? Because you, you make it easy for him. And so the big question that's posed here in chapter 1 is, is Job's faith reliant on the way that God blesses him and makes it easy for him, or does he have true faith in God? That's the question we're going to be talking about here today. Essentially, the question is, what is Job's faith really in? Is his faith in the God of the universe, the one who is over all and through all and in all, or is his faith in the God that caters to his every need? I told you earlier, I, I'm guilty sometimes of thinking that the world revolves around me, and I think one of the places that we do that is in our faith. I think one of the places that we do that is in thinking that God needs to take care of me, that this is about me. This is a huge question for us. It's something I want to ask you today. Is your faith in God based on who God is and the fact that the world revolves around God, or is your faith in God based on the fact that God caters to you because the world revolves around around you is your faith put yourself in job's place here don't not all the way because it wouldn't be fun to be in job's place but put yourself in job's shoes here in this question of is your faith really in god almighty or is your faith in the, a god that caters to you what is your faith in another way to ask this are we characters in the story of the almighty god or is the almighty god a character in the story of us. I'm afraid way too often we, we exist and we operate as if God is a character in our story. But the truth is, the world doesn't revolve around us. So we'll see this question play itself out here. I want to jump towards the end of chapter 1 because Job is doing pretty well at first. So, so we have this discussion and God says, check out my boy Job. He loves me. He honors me. And Satan says, he only loves you and honors you because everything's perfect for him. And so he says, you know, take away that and he won't love you and honor you. And God says, all right, he's in your hands. Do what you need to do, but don't kill him. And so what we see early on is, is Job starts to be hit with, with some difficulty. And we're talking in this series about pain and the difficulty in the world around us. And, and the truth is, there's probably some of you here today that are experiencing difficulty that you would say, I can relate with Job. But what we see is that Job starts to lose these blessings all around him. His livelihood, his work all of the things that seemed like they were going perfect all of a sudden started going against him. And at the end of chapter 1, verse 20, we see that Job starts out in a pretty good place. He says at this, Job got up and tore his robe and shaved his head. That obviously isn't a good place, but what he says next is good. Then he fell to the ground in worship and said, Naked I come from my mother's womb, and naked I will depart the Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. That's incredible. If you lost all of the blessings around you, would that be your response? Job says, the Lord gave and the Lord has taken away, but the name of the Lord is to be praised. He's in a good place. Then again in chapter 2, his wife says to him, are you still maintaining your integrity curse God and die. I want you to remember these, these words. These will come in handy in the next few weeks. But his wife says, hey, you've lost it all. Are you still sticking faithful to that God that's clearly turned on you? Curse God, curse God and die. And Job replies, you are talking like a foolish woman. Now, I don't recommend talking to your wife this way. He replied, you are talking like a foolish woman. And th this question's a good question. Shall we accept good from God and not trouble? In other words, is God just here to give us good things, but, but anything that's bad? Can we accept the good without accepting the bad? And so, once again, do not call your wife foolish. That's not a good idea. 
But Job, we see early on, is, is in the right place. He knows that bad things are happening, but he still praises God. Now, I want to take a second, and, and, and Dale asked a question last week that I think is so important. Why do bad things happen to good people? Why do bad things happen when it seems like we don't deserve them? And I am not the expert on this, but, uh, but I just want to take a moment and talk about that. I do not believe, and I thought Dale said this well last week, I do not believe that God tries to hurt us or does things to hurt us just to try to teach other people or other things. We make a huge mistake in the church of saying things to people that are struggling and people that are hurting, of saying things, and you'll see this later on, probably not this week, but next week in the arguments of Job, that you see things and you hear things in the church of, well, that was God's plan so that God could do this. Well, God caused that to happen so that this could happen. Listen, I think that is false theology. I do not believe that God tries to hurt us just to teach lessons elsewhere. I believe that God created us and gave us the ability to choose. And when Adam and Eve chose themselves over God, sickness and death and evil entered the world, and I think the things that happen today are results of our choices. Now, I'm not saying that if you are sick, it's a result of your choice. I'm saying that sickness and evil and death are the result of man, Adam and Eve's original choice to go against God. And so I do not believe that God is striking Job just to teach him a lesson. I don't believe that's what's happening. Now, I do want to say this. God is God. And God does have the ability to do whatever God wants. That's kind of what we're getting at. But I don't think that's what's happening. So I want to make that clear from the outset. I don't think that this is all about just striking Job down to teach him a lesson. I don't believe if you're struggling today that you're struggling because God's doing that to you to try to teach you something. Here's what I believe. I believe that the things that happen to us are the result of sin and death entering the world through Adam and Eve. And here's where I think the big difference is. I think God works for the good in all things for those who love him. So I think when bad things happen and when suffering happens, God is there. And God wants to work good. Not God causes it so that he can work good, but, but God allows the world to operate this way and things happen. And then God works for the good in those things. So you can suffer and God can bring good of it. You can go through difficulty and God can bring good of it. But it's important to know that I do not believe and we do not believe that God is trying to hurt us. I don't think this is about hurting Job. Then his friends come in. So we'll move on. Then his friends come in. And they start this debate, this discussion. And I want to boil this all down because I, I, we don't have time to go through all this. We're going to talk a little bit more about it next week. But basically the discussion is this. His friends say, Job, you have to have done something wrong because if you hadn't done something wrong, you wouldn't be suffering. In other words, his friends, and I think Dale touched on this last week, his friends had a cause and effect view of God and God's blessings. That if you are good, you are blessed. If you are bad, you are cursed. And so his friends say, Job, you've clearly messed up, and that's why you're suffering. That's why you're struggling. Job continues to maintain, I haven't done bad. I haven't done wrong. I've been faithful. But he continues to suffer. And so, so their argument is, is that our earthly lives, our earthly status is indicative of our standing with God. And, and Job even agrees with them later on that clearly God has turned against them. I think sometimes we make this mistake of thinking that if things are going really well, then God really loves us. But when things go poorly, when everything turns around in a negative way, that God has turned away from us and that God clearly doesn't love us anymore. I'm going to be honest, I made that mistake growing up. I was a pastor's kid. I grew up in a pastor's home and, and I was a pretty good kid. Don't ask my sister, but I was a pretty good kid. I felt like I did what was right 
most of the time. I wasn't perfect. I'm far from it. But I felt like I was good. I felt like I, I was at church every time I could be. I, I did everything that I could to do what was right. And sometimes I would get this mentality when things would go wrong. Well, God, what are you doing? I was faithful. I'm the one. Look, those kids are the bad ones. I'm the good one. Why are things going poorly for me? What's this all about? Because we tend to think that God's favor and blessing has to do with the situations around us. But let me ask you a question really quick. Does God owe us anything? Does God owe me anything? Because we tend to think that, that justice, and we think that, that God owes me justice for what happens. If I'm good, God owes me good. So I shouldn't suffer because I'm good, right? Here's, here's the bad news. We've all messed up, and we all deserve bad. But, but that's not what it is. And, and so I ask the question, does God owe us anything? See, Job and his friends think that God owes them reward for their good behavior and punishment for their bad, and so they have this system. And they think there's consequences for their action, and everything around them is indicative of what God thinks of their actions. And I want to be clear. There are consequences for your actions. If you do wrong, there will be consequences. And if you do good, I mean, Proverbs, there are plenty of scriptures that talk about this. Jesus even says things that if you will honor God, God will honor you. But does God owe us anything? Is it, here's the thing, I think we think that God's job is to make sure that I'm okay. That God's ultimate job up there is to make sure that I get blessed when I should be blessed and that I am protected when I shouldn't be, when, when I do the right things, that I'm protected from evil. Hey, God, where are you at? You're not doing your job today. I'm struggling here. H have you quit? God's job isn't to cater to my every need. God doesn't owe me that. This is the big question in the book of Job. And so they go on and on. They go back and forth. And, and Job's friends say, you've messed up. And Job says, no, I haven't. But Job continues to kind of progress. And it gets to the point where he's struggling so much that he says, God, you've turned on me. Where have you gone? And once again, we're going to address this in the, future, in the next few weeks. Please come back. This is a series. But, but Job starts to think God has turned on him. Even though he hasn't done anything wrong, Job starts to think that God's not with him anymore. And then we see this response from God towards the end. I'm not going to read it, but I want to I just break it down for you. This response from God, it's a weird response for somebody who's crying out and saying, God, why is this happening? I don't deserve this. God, where are you? You've turned your back on me. And God comes and he says something along the lines of this. Hey, Job, did you create all this? Hey, Job, can you control all this? Hey, Job, can you control the wild beasts? Can you, can you tame Leviathan as the, the sea monster that he uses and, and behemoth, this land monster? Can you control those? Hey, Job, did you, did you create this? Is this all about you? And I want you to hear Job's response. Job replied to the Lord, I know that you can do all things. No purpose of yours can be thwarted. You ask, who is it that obscures my plans without knowledge? Surely I spoke of things I did not understand, things too wonderful for me to know. You said, listen now and I will speak. I will question you and you shall answer me. Listen to this last line. Job says, my ears had heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. Let me tell you what happens here. God says, Job's my man. He's good. He honors me. He loves me. Satan says he only loves you because things are good. The good is taken away. Job is suffering. And at first he's doing well. He says, the Lord be praised. But then he starts to struggle with his pain. And some of you have been here that you've just suffered for so long that you're struggling to see God in it. And, and Job gets to the point that he starts to really question, God, are you really here for me? What's going on? God, come on, I don't deserve this. Even to the point of, like, God, 
you need to answer for what's happening to me. And then God comes down and he says, let, let me boil it down to this. Who's God? Can you control all this? Is this all about you? Or am I God? And Job's response is, you are God. You are God. And what you do is what happens because you are over all and through all and in all. And so Job goes from the place of, God, it's your job to take care of me. It's your job to help me when I'm hurting. It's your job to protect me to the place of God. It's your world. This all revolves around you. And no matter what happens to me, no matter what happens to me here on earth, you are God and you are to be praised. Do you see what happens there? So, so this question of does the world revolve around me, this is a question that was answered for Job and it's a difficult answer, but the answer is Job, the world doesn't revolve around you and just because you're in pain doesn't mean it's God's job to come fix it because God is God and God is over all and through all and in all. And so Job learns this lesson. What Job realized is that God is God. And he says, I repent of my struggling. I repent of my questioning. I repent of thinking that it's your job to take care of me. I repent of thinking that the world revolves around me and I worship you. Now listen, this is a weird thing for me to talk about in light of suffering, but, but here's the thing. I think way too often when we're suffering, we need to blame God for it, or we need to have answers for why we're suffering. I think way too often we think that our suffering is what everything revolves around, and I'm not trying to be insensitive today, but what I want you to understand is that God is God, and it is not God's job to solve all your problems or to protect you or to shower blessings on you when you do the wrong thing. That's not how this works. So the bad news is, it's not all about you. But, but the good news is this. God came to Job. God loves Job. And in the end, here's the thing. If God didn't love and care for Job, you know what God would have done? He would have just left him alone. He would have let him be. He would have let him finish his time in suffering, but God loves Job, and God comes to Job, and see, this isn't at the end, this isn't Job giving up and saying, okay, whatever, I can't control it, it's yours, I give up. I... This is Job saying, you are God, and I trust you, even in the pain and the suffering. Listen, this morning, I don't know if there's some of you here that are just in the middle of a Job experience where you feel like, I'm sure there's some of you here that just feel like everything is being taken away and everything is going wrong and God's turned his back on you and what's going on and you're crying out. I think there's probably some here today that feel that way. I want you to understand that God is God and God is to be praised no matter what happens to you. But I want you to hear a good news today and that's that God loves you. And your only hope for life and peace and wholeness is in God. That's what Job realized. Sure, everything's been taking, taken away. And, and maybe God's off doing something else. That's not true. God wasn't off doing something else. But God loved Job, and Job realized that his only hope was in the Creator God who this world revolves around. That's good news for us today. If you're suffering, that's good news. God hasn't turned his back on you. God doesn't hate you. You're not being punished. Maybe you're facing some consequences, but God doesn't hate you. God loves you. And God chooses to come to you and offer you love and life. Today, if you're suffering, I just want you to know, I, I don't have the answers for why you're suffering. I don't have the answers for when it's going to turn around, but I have one answer that's really important, and that's that God loves you, and that even though this whole world revolves around God, and it, not, it doesn't at all revolve around me, I'm just an insignificant peon on a mountain that's smaller than the trees and smaller than everything else, even though you are small and insignificant in the grand scheme of things, the creator God that's at the center of it all chooses 
to love you, and to invite you to have life. We're going to finish this service by taking communion. And I know that there's, there's some in here that maybe are questioning today, God, what's going on? Why am I hurting like this? Why is everything being taken away? God, where are you? God, why is this happening? And, and maybe some of you aren't there. Maybe things are going good. But I want you to understand today that the world does not revolve around you and that it's not God's job to take care of your every need and to make sure that things are good. But I want you to know that God loves you. And as we celebrate communion today, as we experience it, as we participate in communion today, I want you to understand that God has invited you to have life. If you're suffering today, your only hope for life is in God. If it's good today, your only hope for life is in God. And so we usually take communion, and a lot of times, once again, I think that we, we think of communion as being about us. This is what God did for us. This is about me. Today, I want you to think about it a little bit differently. And, and God did come for us. That's true. I'm not saying that's wrong. But I want you to think about it differently today. I want you to think about as you take communion today, the fact that everything in this whole world revolves around God, and it's not God's job to, to help us. It's our job to worship and serve God. And so today as we come and take communion, I want you to think about the fact that God is God, and you are you. But then I want you to think about the invitation that God gives us. Because ultimately, Jesus came so that we could have life. In the beginning, God was there. The Father, the Son, the Spirit, this relationship, this love, this peace, that's who God is. And God invites us into this life, to this love, this relationship. I think about what I said earlier about one false step and you could fall off the mountain. Do you remember when Jesus was tested? Satan said, hey, if you fall off this mountain, what happens? Angels catch you because this world revolves around God, but today, as we celebrate communion, I want you to understand that we are invited into life through Christ. That whether you're suffering and you're at the, the bottom of the barrel or whether things are good, the best thing you can do today is to come to Jesus and to worship God with what you have and to understand that your only hope is in the God Almighty, the creator of heaven and earth that came to earth in the flesh to give you life. So the band's going to play a song, and, and we're going to, and we're going to sing this song. We're going to do communion a little bit different. As they sing, I want you to come, and I want you to serve yourself communion. I want you to take the bread, and I want you to dip it into the cup, and I want you to understand that Jesus, who this world revolves around, invites you through his death and resurrection into life. And I want you today, today to offer everything you have, your suffering, your pain, your good times, your family, your work. I want you to offer everything to the God who is over all and through all and in all. Father, as we take communion together, I just pray that you'll open our eyes to who you are. And I pray that we wouldn't have a faith today that's shallow and that's that's based on our circumstances or what you're doing in good ways for us, Lord. But I pray that we would understand that you are the almighty God. And I pray that we would understand that you've invited us into your story. And so as we take this communion, I pray that we would lay ourselves down for you. That we would be where Job was at the beginning there of saying, regardless, good or bad, the name of the Lord is to be praised. So we worship you today. In Jesus' name, amen. As they play, come, serve yourself communion, pray if you want, but understand that you are invited into the story of an almighty God that everything revolves around and give everything you have to God.